Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, December the 11th, 2023 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Um, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can then be placed in the basket on the table over there to my right. I have allotted up to 30 minutes tonight for public comment and ask everyone to keep their comments to three minutes. All right, we want to welcome the uh, student council from Pierce Downer uh, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Whenever you're ready. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'd now like to welcome up uh, Dr. Wagner, principal of Pierce Downer. Good evening. I was told that we had an hour for this presentation. <laughs> Is that correct? That sounds good. All right, so we'll trim off the, uh, the interpretive dance portion of the <laughs> presentation. Uh, first off, board, thank you so much for this opportunity to shine a spotlight on Pierce Downer. Certainly trying to keep all of that uh, you know, down to 10 or 15 minutes is difficult, but I certainly hope to highlight some of the great things we have going on. When you walk into Pierce Downer School, the first thing you're greeted with is a sign that says it's a good day to have a great day. That is something we regularly say in our morning announcements, and I, hopefully it's a good day to have a great board spotlight. This evening I'll be telling you a little bit about our PD Promise. We have some members of our student council to share with you some of the things that they're doing. Um, our parents from the PTA, our co-presidents, are here to talk about the great things they do, and then we'll share some of the additional things that we're proud of. At Pierce Downer School, we have the PD Promise. Every morning on our morning announcements, we remind students that they keep the PD Promise to be respectful, responsible, and safe at Pierce Downer School. We've worked really hard um, over the past two years to really build that promise out and make sure that we really um, match that with the common expectations, so visuals throughout the building. Um, we have those common expectations for the lunchroom, the hallway, the bathroom, at recess, and all of those visuals remind students of that promise to be respectful, responsible, and safe. In addition to just those common expectations, monthly we have what's called the PD Promise Assemblies. This is a great opportunity for us to recognize and celebrate the great things happening around the building. Um, we also give students an opportunity to share any of their celebrations, whether that's personal or within the building as well. And then staff members also uh, celebrate the things that are happening in their classroom. We use this assembly to also remind all the students about common expectations, but also be very specific to target those expectations. So an example would be uh, just this past Friday, we had our uh, PD Promise Assembly where we went over winter expectations. We know as the, the colder temp temperatures uh, come around and the snow starts to fall, we reminded students what those expectations were for their snow gear. Um, how that should be packaged, what the, that they should be dressing for the temperatures. So we went over specific expectations that, to give those reminders to the students. We also use this as an opportunity to remind students that we're safer together. Obviously, we, we continue to prioritize being safe and remind students that if they see something, hear something, and we really emphasize if they feel something, if something just doesn't feel right, to really empower them to say something. Part of our PD Promise Assembly is also our Panther of the Month, month recognition. Um, we think it's very important to obviously recognize students, but we also try to be very specific. So rather than just um, giving, the, giving them a certificate, our uh, staff members have an opportunity to recognize students, and they also give very specific reasons for why they're being recognized. So you can see those certificates that they're holding are accompanied with often paragraphs really explaining the great things that the students are doing and keeping that PD promise. These are done monthly at the assembly, but in between that, we also have an opportunity for any staff to catch any student being caught keeping the PD Promise. So you can see the slip there that they have where they can write their name and grade level, and that's a ticket that'll actually detach where they can rip off the bottom part, put their name in that gold drum that you see there, um, and then there, the staff member can write a little note about why they received that. So they, they can circle that they were being respectful or being responsible or being safe or being safe. And um, 
they just light up. I really enjoy looking there and seeing that, that student there that's, that's just smiling ear to ear. Um, and oftentimes, as excited as they are to put their name in it, I hear how excited they are to go home and tell their parents why they received that ticket. In addition to recognizing students, we really also want to prioritize recognizing Pierce Downer staff. So one thing you'll see there is all the staff members holding the PD cup. This is given to staff members weekly. So every Friday, one uh, staff member that had it before gets to nominate the next PD cup recipient. Um, and they can fill it with goodies. They can um, usually it comes with a really nice uh, note. And we're really trying to encourage staff members to obviously recognize each other. In addition to that, we also have something called the I would crumble without. That's what you see in the upper left corner. Um, staff members at any time can write a nice note to another staff member saying that why they would crumble without them. And then every other week, we have an opportunity to pull one of those. We have a cookie jar in the main office. They pull that out of the cookie jar, and we have winners that win crumble cookies for that. Next up, I am excited to uh, bring up Heather Holland, our student council sponsor, and our two members of our student council. Hello, as Dr. Wagner said, I'm Heather Holland. I teach fourth grade at Pierce Downer, and I have the honor of being the student council sponsor this year. Um, we held elections this year, which we haven't done in quite a while. Uh, we had m a lot of students run for offices, and all the potential members gave great speeches. Got to learn a little bit about democracy and voting and those things. Um, and we have two of our officers here with us tonight. We have Olivia Rabchuk, our president, and Anya Sutherland, who is our activities chair. We also have two members, um, Nettie, who is our vice president, and Michael, who is our secretary, who couldn't be here. So we meet um, pretty much every other week, twice a month, for about 30 minutes to plan things to make Pierce Downer even better for all of our students. And I'm going to let them talk to you now. Last school year, we made nursing, we made cards for nursing homes, raised money for different charities, hosted Winter Wonderland, had many spirit days, sponsored Red Ribbon Week, and made Pierce Downer even better. Already this year, we had elections for our student council officers for the first time in many years. We sponsored Red Ribbon Week and also had some fun spirit days. Only some of those spirit days include pajama day, dress like your favorite winter character, dress like a teacher, wear your sports uniforms, dress like a celebrity, and many more. Coming up on Friday, December 15th, Students and families are invited to come to our Winter Wonderland fundraiser. We will be raising funds to help families in need. We have almost 100 participants signed up this year. And some of our Winter Wonderland activities include a hot chocolate bar, cookie decorating, an ornament craft, photo booth, a candy guest, read-alouds, making reindeer food, and many more. We are all ex very excited for this event each year. Thank you. Can we give them a round of applause? That was fantastic. <laughs> Olivia and Anya, thank you very much. Next up, we have our Pierce Downer PTA. We have Liz Rossi and Jennifer Clems, our co-presidents. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm Jennifer Clems. I have a sixth grade girl at Pierce Downer and a third grade boy. And I'm Liz Rossi. I have a fourth grade daughter and a second grade daughter. Um, and you've gotten slides. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so you can see here we've got a graph of all of the activities and things that we fund as a PTA at Pierce Downer. You can see the bulk of it is ac academic enrichment for the students. Um, we do a lot for teacher support, a lot of support in the classroom, and we'll kind of get into that in the next few slides. Um, so this is where we're going to highlight a few PTA family events. Um, some of the pictures you see here are from the Welcome Back Party and the Donuts with Grown Ups event. These are all big family events where you can meet um, other families and other students before school starts and kind of get to know people who are going to be in your school. If you want to go to the next one. Um, you'll see in these pictures uh, we have our fun run and our golf outing, which um, we decided to make those into fundraisers last year, um, and they were a huge success. Um, and the golf outing was fun. Adults got together kind of outside of school to get to know each other. And the fun run, as you can see, was a very exciting event that raised money for our school. Uh, we also do a sweetheart dance and kickball. 
Um, and then this year we started the One School, One Book program. It was the first time we had done it at Pierce Downer with the book Frindle. And it was really a huge success. We had an event at school where um, there were special uh, guest readers and there were guest readers uh, every week. It was really nice. Um, the next slide is about PTA staff support. Uh, every year we do a teacher grant application and this year we were able to fund all sorts of resources for the classroom for five teachers. Um, we also do teacher allowances uh, for each classroom and for staff and specials. Um, Every May we do our big teacher appreciation week, with I, which I think the teachers do appreciate. Um, and then we also uh, do room representatives to help the teachers. We do copy help for the teachers, LRC help. Um, so a lot of ways we support our staff at Pierce Downer. And then we do a lot for student support. We have an awesome after school enrichment program. We do Young Rembrandts, chess, language labs for Spanish, and we're starting a new one in the spring for mad science. So those are always a huge hit. Um, field trips this year, we actually increased our budget. We doubled it for students, which is awesome. So they get about 20, we give about 25 per student. Um, we have safety patrol, we sponsor student council. Um, we do this awesome program, High Touch High Tech, where I think the, te the teachers really love that. It's like a science kit that's a special lesson they get to do. Um, and then we have Hope Club, which this year is now having fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, which is great. And same with Drama Club. That is new this year, and that is also fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Um, student experiences, I think we do a great job with um, assemblies. One that the kids loved was the Jesse White Tumblers. That was a huge hit. Uh, field day is always fun. We sponsor fun lunch. Um, we do some great things for sixth grade. End of year activities, breakfast, they get a special yearbook. Every year we alternate between an art cot event and science Olympiad and this year we're doing art cot. We do holiday parties, art awareness. Um, just a ton of stuff. A variety show this year will be at the Tivoli. Um, VIP day for first and fifth is um, every year where they get to invite a special person in to show what they do, do a craft. Um, we do a kids show for Battle of the Bands and we are lucky enough to be invited in the um, one of the schools in the Downers Grove North Homecoming Parade. So we march in that every year. And something new we started this summer I think, was Pierce the Panther. So it, it's um, the kids took him on vacation and took pictures and sent them in to Dr. Wagner and it was really fun and our Pierce the Panther also shows up at a lot of events so yeah. and here's some VIP day variety show the homecoming walk and there's a tumbler for Jesse White <laughs> yeah thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now I feel bad because I didn't make a slide that specifically says how proud I am of the parental involvement that we have at Pierce Downer School, um, but they really do play such a vital role to the success of our of our building, and just time and time again, I'm just unbelievably uh, surprised by their generosity and, and dedication to um, making our school such a great place. So thank you. Um, these next few slides are just going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're really proud of happening at Pierce Downer School. First, we did make expected growth overall, um, and we made expected growth for math and reading um, with our ECRA data. But taking a little bit of a deeper dive, looking at our NWA results for math specifically, we have 74% of our students, so basically three out of every four students that are in the high or high average range, um, with 89% of our students at the average or above range. With our NWA scores, we are showing above average growth year over year, so when you look at fall of last year compared to fall of this year, um, we are showing, continuing to show um, more students meeting those growth um, projections. But we're really making a commitment to be responsive over reactive. And what I mean by that is we're really trying to make sure that we're using data to make informed decisions versus just being reactive to a, a potential blip where we're maybe making Band-Aid solutions to try and you know, create short-term um, solutions without really addressing those long-term needs that we might have. One of those that we did address was our reading data. Um, while we do have 82% of students that are in that average or above average range, um, and we do continue to show that above average growth year over year, we do still recognize some of the challenges that we have with our reading data. And because of that, that's a lot of the work that's taking place with our instructional leadership team um, and is a specific goal that we have in our school improvement plan. So we have Sabrina Bro 
and Heather Holland here that are going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing as an instructional leadership team. I'm Sabrina Bro. Sorry, my voice is kind of on. And I teach first grade, and Heather has fourth grade. So we represent kind of both ends of the spectrum at our school. And as a team, we've really looked into Scarborough's reading rope. And last year, as a whole school focused on the bottom end of the rope, pretty much reading very simplified is if you can recognize the words and you understand what those words mean, the language re recognition, you're going to have reading comprehension. And so last year we looked at the word recognition and as a whole school, the phonological awareness and looked across the building and that's the yellow arrow <laughs> that's at the bottom mm -hmm. of the rope. Um, we learned that that helped fill a lot of holes but we needed more for our older students or our students who were already decoding and reading the words. And so that's where this year we dove more into the um, morphemes and understanding the words and the top string of the rope. So we wanted to set a goal this year for instruction um, and to be very have a very specific targeted goal that would have the biggest impact on our students, again, by looking at how we can be responsive to our needs. So in the Intermediate grades, fourth, fifth, and sixth, we have introduced the study of morphemes. So morphemes are just the smallest unit that makes sense. It could be prefixes, suffixes, or root words. We, our amazing reading specialist and one of our other teachers took the, all the lessons divided among fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. Um, so we have prefixes, suffixes, and roots, and working with all those, they know the majority of words, and they can put them together and start to see those words when they come across them on, tests or in text that they can be like, well, I, don't, I know port, I know what that means, with this, it means this, and they can work through that. And it helps supplement our current reading curriculum to help further de develop that language strand. Thank you so much. Um, and I, you know, one of the things I think that's important to emphasize is just the, the fact that we're really trying to make um, targeted decisions to really help support some of that growth. Another thing that we're extremely proud of, and this was absolutely, um, obviously, a, a team effort with the support of the board, the district, obviously the state funding, but, um, but especially our community, in, in less than a year, being able to take a, a park project from just an idea concept to really seeing it through to fruition, and then seeing, you know, immediately the impact that it has on the students from kindergarten through sixth grade um, is really something special, and it's definitely something, it's a, it's a point of emphasis. Um, at how big of a change it can absolutely make, just um, putting in a new playground and giving those students those opportunity to play and build those social connections um, and work on problem solving. There's just so many great things that happen with that, with that playground. And as we always say, we, we, we say it each and every day, we are PD, and I think this is a great way to end it, showing uh, this is our end of year picture that we do each and every year, but it has every one of our students showing the different colors of the rainbow there. Um, definitely something that we're proud of. So once again, Board of Education, I really do appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share our spotlight on Pierce Honor School. Thank you to our staff that were able to join, our students, and our parents. Thank you. Thank you. And to our student council members, we have some gifts coming down for you. Thank you for being here tonight. <clears throat> Great job, kids. Thank you. All right, listed on tonight's agenda is one communication received by the board. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? And that brings us to the spotlight on our school's overview of uh, SASSET's partnership with District 58. Um, so I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, we have our interim superintendents from SASSET, um, Jim and Jimmy, if you'd like to come up to the podium, and then Jessica Stewart, our assistant superintendent for special education. One of the things um, that we have been meaning to do for a long time post-pandemic is just to have SASSET in and provide an overview of the organization and, and how we work very closely with SASSET and also with SASSET going through the executive director search to provide you with an update on, on that process and the direction overall of the cooperative. So welcome, Jim and Jimmy. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We appreciate it. And uh, Jessica, you can take it away. Yeah, and I just want to echo uh, just how pleased I am to be able to be up here tonight talking about our mutual partnership. It's been 10 years since we've done this. It's been a decade, and 
During that time, the needs of our students have certainly changed and uh, across the district we've responded to that and SASIT has as well. So we're really looking forward to highlighting some of the history of cooperatives, um, some of the work that we do together for the benefit of all of our students and also really diving in um, to the other pieces of the cooperative that we benefit from. I think when people hear about SASID, they often think about the programs in particular. We talk about the STARS program and the multi-needs program. And really, uh, we're very much interwoven with them, uh, really having mutual benefit in lots of other ways. So without further ado, uh, I will pass it over to Mr. Jim Nelson and Dr. Jimmy Canel. Thank you, Well, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity for us to uh, Tell you a little bit about SASED. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jessica. So, let's go. You just rolled right through those, didn't you? <laughs> okay. All right. That's the larger. That's the bigger one. Yep. Here we go. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. History of co-ops in Illinois. No, just, just kidding. <laughs> I do want to mention that, that Illinois has a long history of a cooperative model uh, to serve students with disabilities. And um, out of the 850-something districts at last count in the state, um, all but 90 belong to some cooperative arrangement. So it's a, it's a, it's a popular model around Illinois, as well as other states. So uh, SASID has uh, been around for a long time, 1958. We have 18 member districts and uh, quite a diverse uh, group of districts with elementary districts, uh, unit districts, and standalone high school districts. Um, in general, we're here to assist you with compliance, state and federal guidelines, and also we operate the DuPage West Cook programs for uh, deaf, hearing, uh, hard of hearing, hearing impaired, and visually impaired. And that's a bigger co-op, if you will, of uh, 92 districts in, in DuPage in Cook County. And then we serve as uh, an extension to your con continuum of programs and services. And Jessica and Todd are going to talk a little bit more in depth about the partnership uh, that we have uh, together later on in the presentation. So here are our 18 member districts. And setting the stage for improvement. So some kudos going out to the SASID boards, uh, Dr. Russell and and Emily Hannes serve on the governing board and the board of directors. They did, uh, they did all the heavy lifting last year with um, the strategic plan and reviewing, uh, revising the articles of agreement. One of the things that Jim and I were excited about um, when we were interviewed is the change in the article of agreements which restructured your boards. So now you have a board of directors, which is uh, the 18 superintendents, and they really are the board of control or board of authority. And they meet every month for uh, take care of daily uh, monthly operations. And then three times a year, the governing board gets together, and they're responsible for two major things, two critical things. One is hiring the executive director, and two, approving a budget. And they meet again three times a year. Um, so that is a really, really good model. Jim's former co-op, my former co-op, uh, they have the similar models, and it's been very successful for them. So I think with the revision of the articles, uh, the restructuring of the boards. And then uh, the strategic plan that they approved last spring for the next three years, we're in good shape moving forward. So um, we're setting the stage here. As far as changes in leadership, um, obviously there was an unexpected departure of the executive director in late June of last year. Therefore, uh, we were hired by the board of directors, uh, Jim and I, to split the position for this um, uh, school year. Uh, the changes in leadership uh, also with a new CSBO, our new, uh, new chief financial officer, Rachel Visnuski. She's new. Uh, she's very promising. She's going to do a great job. And um, as far as uh, the director's search, probably the most important thing this evening is we had a fantastic pool of 17 applicants. Uh, the, uh, the search committee comprised of both governing board and board of directors thoroughly vetted these, uh, these applicants and we interviewed six um, uh, candidates last week, and we are down to the final two, which that will occur uh, with the Board of Directors on Wednesday. So we're really excited about the possibility of bringing a high caliber executive director on board moving forward. Uh, with respect to our, our roles and responsibilities, I'll just say this. The, the, the interview team, which was the Board of Directors, 
They made it very clear that we were not on maintenance mode this year. So they let Jim and I know that uh, they wanted to take advantage of our 30 plus years as uh, executive directors at, at two different co-ops. They wanted us to look at, um, oh, looking for efficiencies um, in, um, in operations, also looking at programs and services, looking at billing, how we do billing, and the big one here is restructuring our, our financial model. So we're working towards those things. We have some things in place already. Um, and I forgot to mention the uh, strategic plan includes four, four priority areas, and that is staffing, high quality staffing, uh, exemplary programs and services, communications, and then um, operations, which includes um, a facility, a long-term facility plan. So that's, uh, that's where we're going for the next three years. Um, since Jim and I came on board uh, late July, early August, we have been working very hard to promote a growth mindset for the SAS and staff. Because we believe um, with that mindset that whatever they do at SAS Ed, they can do they can do better with time and energy and seeing how it aligns to the strategic plan. So Jim's going to talk about some of those initiatives and activities we've undertaken since uh, August. So we fully addressed uh, the climate and community at SASIC when we took over. We started taking a look at those policies, procedures, and practices, and we took a deeper dive into getting the handbook aligned, getting the strategic plan aligned, getting the, the uh, parent handbook, all of that to be aligned um, was the first order of business that we did. Uh, once that was done, we wanted to celebrate this with the staff. So we had a big kickoff. Uh, thank you to Downers Grove North. We had our 400 staff members there and we celebrated. Uh, we have a journey to 2027, which is when our strategic plan is up. And we have those four pillars that Jimmy talked about that that's what we're gonna focus on. Keep focusing on this, it's good for kids. The other things that we implemented was a, a collaborative leader, leadership style. We brought in um, IT into the administrative <coughs> council. We brought in the curriculum people, administrative council, to sit down and talk about what SASIT does great, what do we need to work on, where do we need to stick our energy on. Uh, that has been uh, it, very valuable to get everybody's perspective on that. Another key component that we did is we uh, hosted a parent community event that was just housed uh, last week. Uh, to get that parent perspective of SASIT. Where can we shore things up? Where can we do better? Uh, what things are going well? Uh, simple plus delta gives us a substantial amount of uh, information to go forward. We believe that communication is essential, so we are cranking out information to our board members. We are cranking information out to our parents. We are cranking information out to all staff. Uh, covering 18 districts and 59 programs amongst them, it feels kind of isolating out there in the classrooms and we want to make sure that they get the message from SASET and they keep focusing on those four pillars of our um, strategic plan. So we are trying to, as much as we can, over communicate with everybody. That over communication, we also uh, really developed uh, um, uh, a cooperative corner newsletter that encompasses every program of SASET from down to a basic you know, intervention all the way up to programming. And everything is featured in that communicative, uh, in that communi uh, cooperative corner. That is pushed out to the board, it is pushed out to the parents, it is pushed out to staff. The other thing that SAS said uh, we started to implement was an MVP, very similar to what you do at uh, your school. Um, uh, really celebrating some of the strengths and we developed an MVP, your most valuable player, and we're celebrating those people that are really doing uh, extraordinarily wonderful measures for our students with special needs. The other thing that we, uh, we had to get into, which was a slow roll, but we needed to face the social media and launch a Facebook page and really push out all the things that we need to celebrate <coughs> that we are doing for kids. So we launched that a couple weeks ago and have our Facebook page uh, up and running. Uh, we also push out, uh, one more thing on the communication, a monthly um, a Mindful Monday, uh, just trying to have staff focus on um, being more mindful of uh, their self-care and connecting with kids and developing those relationships. Uh, a quick rundown of our program. Uh, 
the Deaf and Hard of Hearing program and the Vision program, which is going to be on the next slide. Those two programs are part of the DuPage West Cook uh, board meeting, which is a uh, board which is 92 districts, which covers uh, a very large regional area. That is for a very small percentage uh, called low incidence. So uh, that Deaf and Hard of Hearing program, although under SASED, is part of the DuPage West Cook uh, program. The Directions program, that is uh, a program that we uh, have over at Southeast School. Uh, that is for our internalizers, uh, students that have special needs regarding internalizing um, and needing uh, help with regulating. Our multi-needs, which uh, we have some um, right here in uh, Downers Grove 58, our multi-needs, students that have uh, needs that exceed what they can be provided in their home district. Um, so we have a very large multi-needs program. <coughs> Southeast Academy, which I talked about, that is a program and it's a building that is over on Ogden. Uh, this program um, really uh, addresses our EDBD population and that would be more of our externalizers. Three more programs to talk about. Our STARS program, which uh, you alluded to, that's our students that are uh, typically on a spectrum that needs uh, that dysregulation um, and sensory to really get them to focus on uh, learning. That's what we're all about. But, but the next one is our transition and project search. This is for our young adults. Um, it's a program that we have 12th grade on up to 23. And then our last program, which I alluded to with the deaf and hard of hearing, the vision program, which is again part of that DuPage West Cook 92 districts that SASED is the administrative agent for. Um, we have a director of programs and services. Uh, Matt Layton is un unable to be here today. Uh, Jimmy and I sent him home. He was not feeling well today. <laughs> so um, I do have his slides. Uh, he implemented a, a a great technique that uh, I'm actually very jealous. Uh, so we're in year two of doing learning walkthroughs. Um, our number one thing that we always say is you need to connect with kids, connect with kids, connect with kids. But that second thing, which is a really, really close second, is making sure that there's student learning. And uh, the best way to do that is do, uh, to do learning walkthroughs. Um, Part of the learning walkthrough is going in and looking for specific items within a classroom. This does a multitude of things. One, it desensitizes uh, the classroom from administrators being in their room, right? You come in, you're looking, you're checking in, but it also does some great things to make sure that uh, the curriculum is being implemented, that everybody knows the curriculum, down to a paraprofessional teacher assistant. Everybody should know what they're doing and where that goal is and what curriculum you're using. Uh, a learning walkthrough really systematically provides that. So uh, when you look at our pillar, student learning is one of those uh, pillars that fall under all four of those domains, and uh, the learning walkthrough certainly is uh, one of those items. It also provides us where we need to stick additional coaching. It also sticks where we need to put uh, professional development. And it really uh, highlights that differentiation instruction that all of our students with special needs need. So um, we're very happy about our learning walkthroughs. It really helps our programs uh, grow. I think the next one is yours, Jessica. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jimmy. You know, um, all this continued improve, improvement work that we're seeing coming from SASSET and that we're participating in as a district is really exciting. And I just, again, want to highlight, while our students who are participating in SASSET programs are receiving direct benefit from that, this slide really just speaks to some of the other uh, supports and services and the ways that we work together uh, with SASSET to really benefit uh, not just students within the program, but students across the district. Um, so certainly, you know, you would see uh, SASSET staff uh, in our buildings helping with specialized instruction to um, help identify uh, an assistive tech device to help a student uh, who maybe didn't have verbal communication. Uh, but you'd also see them in training uh, general education staff on the zones of regulation. Um, we certainly, we benefit from those very specialized services and then we also have opportunities where they're in and uh, helping with lots of our other initiatives. So um, we wanted just to also just take a chance to talk about that really from a financial perspective for the district as well. So I'm going to hand things over to Todd. I we agree to end on a table. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> 
As the board's aware, uh, every year when you have the uh, ESSA report to come out and, it, and we review uh, outplacement students and costs and, and what we have done over the last uh, three, four years in bringing programs in-house uh, and adjusting and, and being able to um, build programs, make, uh, make it available for you know, at least uh, restrictive and, and closest to home. Uh, and also uh, managing some of those costs in private placement, but also in, in, in some of those asset programs. We've been able to make um, you know, adjustments in that. And so we went back and looked at, uh, and what you have in the presentation, a 2019, um, we don't try to look at doing a table or a, gra a graph of sorts, and it's really kind of hard given the data that you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> when we get a, a report every year as to what our program um, actuals are and then what we're looking at for the next year uh, from SASID. Um, we have your 2019 actuals and then your 2024 uh, projected costs that we're you know, working with um, at the start of the year um, as comparisons. And as the number of students, um, now we didn't have all 119, but some of those students are in multiple programs and you see that first table. Um, and the cost per for those programs. And then you have the second side which is a staffing piece as to how much is in additional staffing and, and services. And so you have um, where we're at in 2019, where we're at currently at 2024. Um, essentially we're you know <clears throat> pretty close to even as far as cost overall, um, but our needs have shifted significantly. Uh, we have more students uh, in District 58 uh, buildings and in programs. Um, and we have more services that uh, SASID is providing at times uh, you know, for us, for students, uh, that we sometimes don't have enough of to have a full-time staff member or just, you know, it, it makes more sense to have SASID. So we wanted just to kind <clears> of <throat> give a financial quick review of, of, of cost overall from one, you know, over the five-year period. Uh, certainly, you know, throughout the year and when you see the final year uh, ESSA report that you get in September, <clears throat> you see the difference in what we've been doing, um, you know, in the special ed cost area of bringing programs in uh, and making some of those adjustments and having some of those less private placements. And so now I turn over to everyone else for questions. <laughs> so we didn't end on a table. We ended on the question <laughs> file. <laughs> right, so. Any questions or comments? Go Just ahead. comment that... Um, uh, I've been on the board for a while, and, and Emily has been our representative. Uh, before Emily, it was me, and before me, it was Doug Purcell, and, and we spent more time talking about SAS and tonight than I think every other meeting I've been on the board combined. Um, maybe with, if you take out the last few months, because now we're actually starting to, to bring more attention to it, which I think that's really important. I mean, the last slide illustrates the significant investment we make in uh, the SASA program every year. And also, you know, we, you know, we have to remember that these are our most needy students, um, uh, and so we, we do need to be thinking about this more as a board and, and and knowing where our money goes and knowing how our students are being served. So I'm really appreciative to the the SAS and staff and to the 58 staff putting this, this presentation together. And uh, as I mentioned to Mr. Nelson before the meeting, um, I was on the on the SAS uh, board of control on the governing board uh, for a couple of years, from 19 to 21. Um, it was at the time that we saw some, some opportunities for improvement there and changes slow in education. Um, but since they've come on, I've, I've heard from people, because I know people who, who work at, at SASID, I know people whose children go to SASID, I've heard that things have been, uh, I've heard from Dr. Russell, I've heard there have been some great improvements. And I, I've heard that, there, that, um, that the, the, just the general feeling about, about how things are going is, is, is much improved. So thank you both very much. Um, I, I feel like we can be very confident as a board that you guys are, are making some good changes and also you're, you're putting us in a place where when you, put, you pass the baton off in, in June uh, that we are going to be, um, we're going to be, we're going to be rolling really well. So thank you both very much for helping us turn the tide around because these are, these are our, like I said, our neediest kids and, and they need the best service they can get. I appreciate that. And our number one, our number one goal, which we, is we're setting that next person up for success. That, that we're, we're, we're in it to get it set up for a successful next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. All right, that brings us to reports to the board. I'm going to go ahead and start with the superintendent report, Dr. Russell. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone uh, to the board meeting. We're glad you're here and for those listening online as well. Um, in terms of our personnel update, our personnel department always handles the school calendar. Um, for years, we have heard requests from the Board of Education, uh, from our staff, and from our community members to switch to a two-year calendar format. Uh, we're very pleased to announce that later this evening, Mr. Sissel will uh, be sharing those with the board for an action item, and we will be moving to a two-year calendar pending board approval. We really hope this helps our families and our staff with planning, and as we march toward the end of construction, full alignment with District 99. A um, couple of points though in the proposed calendars, you will see that the administration recommends that e-learning days be utilized if the district has to host an election. There are sometimes primaries where we don't have to host an election. I just want to remind everyone that as an elementary district, remote learning is very challenging and this is being recommended solely because of construction. Once we get through the construction, we'll revisit that uh, conversation. The other thing is early release is separate from the school calendar. So we are committed to later on in the spring, uh, coming back and doing a review of early release. I fully intend as the superintendent to continue recommending doing early release. But um, one of the questions I did get from members is, you know, should we approve this if we haven't had that conversation yet? That conversation will come in the spring and nothing that you're approving tonight would um, hinder early release or prevent it from uh, moving forward. In terms of curriculum and instruction, we were very pleased last night to host a huge event at O'Neill Middle School. Our district PTA held its annual Reflections Arts Program award ceremony last Tuesday the 5th. The PTA recognized 89 student pieces during the event. 39 are advancing to the DuPage East Regional. I want to thank Liz Earhart, Faith Bear, and all the principals for attending and all the families. It was great seeing the excitement on the students' faces and it's always nice when we can recognize students for going above and beyond beyond the curriculum and we had a great turnout last week at O'Neill so that was a lot of fun. In terms of finance, the district has received the draft uh, annual financial report uh, from our auditors. So we'll be going through that with the Board of Education and the FAC in January. Uh, January's board meeting will come quickly because it's right after spring break. It's that first day we get back from spring break. So winter just break. as a heads up, excuse me, winter break. I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. <laughs> Uh, in terms of technology, the technology department, or department, excuse me, has been collaborating with the facilities department on preparing the request for proposals for network cabling in our phase one elementary project. This proposal will be posted on the E-rate portal and eligible for partial reimbursement through that process from the federal government. The RFP will be posted before winter break and we hope to select a proposal in late January. Uh, this work will be completed this summer in coordination with <coughs> other projects occurring at the phase one uh, buildings, both the middle schools and the phase one elementary schools. Special services. To remove barriers to accessing mental health services, the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 has partnered with Referral GPS and so has District 99. This collaboration provides District 58 families and staff with access, or access to a curated database of mental health professionals through re Referral GPS at no cost. Funding is made possible through the recent state grant that District 58 earned, so this is how we're utilizing uh, that money. We had a full presentation with our building principals. The principals were very excited, so when families reach out and say, you know, do you know any names or where can I go, we can offer them uh, this database search and then they can select a provider uh, much easier uh, for them. The district does not pick up the cost of the services, but we uh, connect them uh, based on their insurance programs and other means into those uh, providers. So we are very excited about that opportunity uh, for our families. In terms of facilities, starting on Saturday, December 23rd, we start physical construction for the referendum at our schools. This is a major step for our four-year construction program. I know we have several of our construction representatives in the audience. Uh, asbestos abatement activities have been scheduled for Herrick and O'Neill Middle Schools to support renovations to upgrade and improve our buildings. Getting this jump start over winter break will allow us to really hit the ground running when it comes to the summer because we have such a tight construction window. So I want to thank all of our construction partners for really doing that heavy lifting to get us to this point. And uh, it is exciting that we are finally starting those construction projects and uh, we will be doing that for the next four years. Okay. Uh, in terms of public relations, we are so blessed in District 58 to have so many community groups that support our students and family during the holiday seasons and really throughout uh, the year. 
particularly around the holidays, several community groups step up to make sure that not only our schools are supported, but those in need are. So I'd like to list off um, the contributors that have either reached out to the school district or our families in need to support them during the holiday season and throughout the school year. I'd like to thank Downers Grove uh, Roadrunner Soccer Club. They donated holiday gifts for 130 children in need. Blessings in a Backpack continues to provide weekend meals for children facing food insecurity. The St. Joseph Knights of Columbus donated 76 winter coats for our students in need. The M5 Foundation provided new snow pants and boots for 23 students. Sharing Connections donated hats, gloves, and scarves for 100 children. St. Joe's Vincent de Paul Society provided toys for 25 students and winter wear for approximately 72 students. The Downers Grove Loyal Order of Moose Lodge donated three boxes filled with hats, gloves, and scarves. Emanuel Lutheran Church provided 350 Thanksgiving and Christmas meals for our families in need. Stitches to Share created and donated 30 hand-knitted scarves, hats, and mittens for students. The Downers Grove Junior Women's Club provided snow pants and boots for 15 students. And Downers Grove First United Methodist Church's Mission, Justice, and Community Program donated eight $25 Target gift cards to each school for families facing extreme hardship. Um, I've been in Downers Grove for a long time, first as a student, as a teacher, and now as an administrator, and I have never witnessed a moment where the community hasn't been able to step up and support those in need. So on behalf of all of us in District 58, we want to thank our community partners. We're very proud to partner with them and very grateful for everything that they do for our students. And of course, this doesn't include the hundreds, if not thousands, of anonymous donors throughout the year uh, that help all of our uh, children. Uh, to close my superintendent's report, on behalf of the board and the entire District 58 staff, we'd like to wish our students and community members and families happy holidays and a very happy new year. We hope everyone gets the chance to enjoy the holidays with their families and friends. And winter break will be starting uh, almost in two weeks here. So it's that time of year, it's hard to believe. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? All right, that moves us to the monthly business, the investment, and the year-to-date report, as well as the treasurer's report. Good evening. Um, in the year-to-date report, uh, this, we, we, went, we had an opportunity to have a FAC meeting on Friday morning and went through a lot of these things that you have, uh, you have a few, several informational items on, on the meeting agenda for today, and uh, those will come back uh, at a later date for, for action for the board. Uh, year-to-date report, uh, everything is kind of moving along as expected. Um, there's one caution piece that uh, I, I pointed out the FAC I like to, to remind uh, the board as well and that is when you're looking at the expenses uh, we are one payroll off because of how we started so you always want to have but there's about a two million dollar um, differential between where we where you normally see your expenditures and where they are currently so if you had two million dollars uh, to the number of expenditures to kind of uh, equal it out we're running right where you know where we expect and and, and right at the at the uh, trending data that we have over the over the years uh, i also want to take a moment um as dr russell had pointed out um, the january meeting comes up very quickly we are closed on the first and second uh the, and so we will not we won't actually even have statements uh, from some of the banks until um, we're sending out the board packet so we won't have a year-to-date report uh, at the January meeting and once we have it we will post it and send it out to everyone uh, but we just won't have it for that Friday posting or um, probably you know everything back uh, in in-house by Monday by Monday so but I do expect that you know that ne next week and we will get that out to the board a uh, <clears throat> couple items uh, the information items that were on uh, in the business uh, report and that were discussed at the FAC is this is the time of year that um, we asked the board to consider registration fee adjustments uh, for the following year so that we are preparing for registration for the 24-25 school year. Um, <clears throat> we had a conversation at the FAC meeting about that and what we have, what our model has been the last several years is to grow those fees by inflation uh, for those mostly the material items those fees that are specifically tied to a service such as transportation we tie those to the contract uh, what what the increases are going to be and in fact we're getting some of those numbers back um, <coughs> this week and next uh, as to what you know the what their expectations are for those renewals 
and so those would be included and that would be something we would bring back to the board at the january uh, meeting for approval um the fac had recommended or uh, agreed with continuing with that inflationary number um, that we've been working with uh, additionally there is an information memo about food service and a, a structure and a timeline uh, to work through our next processes we are on a one year contract for our national school lunch approved program at the middle schools and so we either need to move off of that uh, national school lunch or we have to put that out to bid uh, and go through that state process and so uh, we've kind of laid out a, a, a a structure and a system and, and a process uh, to do that and to go through an, a, a discussion point both through the FAC meeting uh, and, and with the board on that we'll start we'll have a special meeting of the of the Advisory Committee Financial Advisory Committee on January 12th um, not only will we have the auditor there but we will also uh, have a, the lion's share of that meeting talking about food service and, and steps on for the next and, and talk about the uh, the financial impact and also what uh, what the program differences are between national school lunch and, and going off program and what that would look like um, so those are the two uh, informational items you have on the agenda we have more coming up when you get to discussion with the capital piece uh, other than that I'll uh, open up if there's any questions questions or comments from the board thank you Todd appreciate it Okay, that brings us to the Poli policy committee, which has not met since the last board meeting, and neither has the legislative committee. The financial advisory committee has met. We met on December the 8th, which is last Friday. Um, and Todd gave you a glimpse into some of that, but we did obviously review the um, year-to-date report. We discussed the school fees. We're at that time of year again. And as, as he reiterated, about five years ago, we, we went to working in uh, based on inflation. Uh, because what we used to do is every couple of years arbitrarily when we realized we were we were coming up short on dollars we would just sort of spike it and that was never received very well uh, and so we had moved to following the inflation model the downside to that is the last couple of years inflation has been quite high um, at the same time our expenses have, have skyrocketed as well so um, but we did discuss we took some time discussing the fee model and, and how we communicate our fees to the community in, in general and and how we do it to try to be the most transparent in the way that we're setting our rate uh, our fees uh, we, we talked about electricity rates uh, you may recall a while back we had talked about how lucky we were at one point with both our, our our natural gas and our electricity that we had locked in some rates when they had hit historic lows so for a long time we weren't burdened at the same spiking that everybody else was uh, we're not in that situation now we're gonna have to um, renegotiate now luckily we're not at the high peaks that we were once at but obviously anyone who's, who's paying their electric bill at home knows it's um, it's it's not they're not as reasonable as they they once were open enrollment um, we talked about that as far as health insurance was concerned we saw overall enrollment go up so some costs have gone up but we're also seeing a lot of people really latch onto the HSA which is both good for our staff and good for us uh, overall uh, we spent a, a, a bit of time talking about the construction bids which we're going to talk about later today so I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions on how that that went but we had some nice conversation there and we talked about the food service contract and the work that's being done in the grade schools right now including the that cold lunch program that we have uh, th there's a timeline and if we want to stay on the national school lunch program that we're gonna to have to go out to bid pretty soon as Todd was saying and we need to talk about what that looks like uh, as well for the elementary school district so we're hoping to have some more information to discuss with the board as a whole with the, the success, success of that program which you know right now I think on average is having 78 kids sort of in the elementary schools across our district take advantage of that uh, that is not uniform across the district you know we have some schools that have none but some schools that, that are much higher um, when we talked about to get a better understanding of this because um, it's generally a low adoption right now is to potentially go out and survey or reach back out to people saying while you may not be taking advantage of this now would that change when we move to a, a, a hot lunch program and so we're we're going to be talking about what that looks like next steps how we get to a hot lunch program um, what are our options from now up until the point that we go 
we have all the kitchen set up and things. So we have a, th those are some discussions that are going to come through FAC, but we're going to have to bring it here to make sure that the whole board really understands the impact that that has on our district financially and the benefits that it brings uh, to our students. So um, expect more conversation around that in February. Uh, with that, I will take any questions unless Steve, if there's something that I that I missed. No. Okay. Any questions or comments? All right, and that concludes my report. All right, the district leadership team has not met since the last meeting, neither has the Health and Wellness Committee. So that brings us to the SASID report with Dr. Russell. Yeah, uh, given Jim and Jimmy's report with Jessica and Todd, uh, I won't add anything else. Um, again, we're meeting on uh, Wednesday to do final interviews for the new executive director, so we hope in January to have an announcement uh, for the Board of Education. Great. Uh, questions or comments? All right, that brings us to our discussion item of the night. We have on tonight's agenda, uh, the uh, a big group number two, which is focused on our middle schools. Uh, I don't know, if Kevin, if you want to start this off, or if we're going to bring up uh, Kevin Bardo. Thank you, Kevin. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to have several partners, uh, construction partners, join me here. Uh, I get the easy slide. I just get the inter introduction slide. So I'm going to kick this to uh, Mike Huffman from Huffman Kiel. Uh, Huffman Kiel is our owner's project manager, owner's representative for this work. And uh, Mike's gonna go through the information packet here. Okay, thank you. James, do I have control of the change of the slides here? James, that uh, slide makes sense. It's sitting right next to your computer there. Okay. Big button. Big button, I can do that. <laughs> My wife always takes this away from me at home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a uh, general project progress uh, reporting for you tonight, and then of course as, as stated, very specific information on your action item, which is uh, considering the subcontractor bids that we received. So I do want to encourage you to uh, break in with uh, questions you have at any point here, and uh, uh, please uh, let, it, let it be a dialogue. Um, so in general, we, we've had a, a very robust uh, design phase and uh, I do want to compliment uh, Amy who's here tonight from from White on uh, a very well organized process uh, in, in uh, gleaning the required information from a broad constituent base and really doing so in a, a very organized manner so uh, as you can see on your slide we're uh, in in the phase one projects uh, we're 95 percent complete with the, the design effort mm -hmm. on the middle schools and about 80% complete on uh, the elementary schools. Um, so that process is going well and is, uh, is coming to an end. Uh, we'll all be happy to have a little more free time on our calendars, I think, after the design phase is done. Um, we, we, we do, of course, have the, the next phase of design, which uh, we'll, we'll commence here uh, uh, shortly in the beginning of, t of 2024. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the AHJ approvals, which is the authorities having jurisdiction. Um, the uh, Village uh, Common Council will uh, meet th uh, this week, uh, that's what, tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, for the first read uh, of uh, ap approvals on the project and then uh, hopefully <coughs> A week later, we'll get their full support on the projects. The Illinois State Board of Education uh, is underway with the plan review. That results in our, uh, our building permit uh, allowing us to move forward and actually uh, proceed into construction. Uh, then on the owner direct side, uh, uh, contracts that uh, uh, outside of the design team uh, the biggest one there is uh, with TEM, our environmental consultant, and they've been wrapping up their work uh, for all of the phase one projects. Technology, furniture, uh, move management, those are all activities that are, are ongoing. There's been quite a few discussions about move management, which uh, in, in your case with 13 schools and uh, renovation in all of those moving uh, is going to be a, an activity that we want to have well coordinated well thought out uh, and that planning I think has has gone quite well um, as we move on to uh, the, the bidding 
um, as, as we've reported to you previously, oops, here we go. Um, we did have a, uh, an equipment, uh, an early procurement package for equipment related to uh, the middle schools and the elementary schools. Uh, that was a, a very extensive discussion uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the equipment that we could get uh, uh, in a timely manner, even though we were out with an early bid package. Uh, I think those uh, discussions were fruitful and uh, we're well into that. Uh, in fact, uh, next month you will receive uh, the first invoices from the, that early bid package. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll get to uh, bid group two, uh, which is uh, the subcontractors we're making recommendation for approval on tonight. Um, Bully and Andrews had a, a, a good process, uh, communicated well to the subcontractor community. Uh, we had 18 trade packages that we uh, solicited bids for and got 56 bids across those 18 packages. So that was uh, a good participation had good part participation in, in almost all categories. There were a couple where we were a little bit thin, and so we've done a little more extensive review at those particular packages. Uh, over the last two weeks, there have been uh, numerous conference calls where we've gone through and evaluated uh, all of the bid packages uh, with a, a large group of people giving opinions on it, evaluating, as I said, those uh, more lean bid packages a little bit more closely to compare them to uh, historical uh, uh, costs, and uh, we feel like we're in a good, good position there. Um, and then, I guess, uh, on, on to uh, construction, we've got uh, our environmental work uh, that is before you here tonight uh, to be awarded. If, uh, if we uh, get your approval and are able to go into contracting for uh, demolition and abatement, uh, that work will start on the 23rd of this month, and that is uh, just some enabling work that we can get done uh, over, over the break time to be better positioned uh, to um, accomplish the work we need to uh, when the spring comes. Um, in construction, we'll move into a, a, a mode where our organized meetings uh, shift from, from White over to Bully and Andrews. We'll have what's called owner-architect contractor meetings. Um, uh, regularly, we'll, we'll discuss uh, sort of at a, at a high level the, the management of the project. And then beyond that, it, uh, the, kind of the next tier of, of detail would be subcontractor meetings uh, that will start to, start to occur. Um, Here we go. Budget reporting. So uh, when Jordan was last here, um, he received some feedback from you on the type of uh, reporting that you'd like to see uh, uh, within the budget. So we want to re respond to that. Um, and really just to walk you through it, the, uh, in the bidding phase, the reporting really focuses on the comparison. So what, are our, what were our estimates uh, by Bully and Andrews? that established our, our budget that our designers had to work within, and then how does that compare to the bid results we actually get? So we're gonna go through a little bit, that a little bit more detail today uh, with respect to bid, bid group two. Um, overall, we're currently 2.7% under budget for the bid packages that have been released today, bid group one, bid group two. Really bid group one, was right on, on the budget, so it really all comes down to the results we've gotten in, in bid group two here. Um, and then I guess a, 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 a bit of warning as, as we go forward, it's good to celebrate the success on the bids, but uh, it's not really <coughs> reflective on what we might see in the future bid packages. Very, very much dependent on the market at the time uh, that the bids go out. So uh, we hit it at a I think a, a reasonably good time right now and hope that that will continue on as we pursue the, the future bid packages, but uh, just, just a word of caution there. Um, construction reporting, uh, we will likely focus uh, here uh, on the budget and construction reporting. Um, 
change orders, change orders that are being considered, change orders where we're asking for your approval, uh, reporting on the execution of that work as well as uh, all of the base bid work. Um, progress uh, will also be reported to you in the, in the budget in terms of uh, invoices paid to date and uh, projections of a cost on a particular item versus what its initial budget was. Um, and then how we're, how we're doing on the balance to complete on that. And then finally into soft costs, uh, your soft costs won't vary nearly as much as, as, as the hard costs. You've got um, under contract, uh, White of course, Huffman Keel Partners, there's other areas like uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, move management that are yet to be determined and we'll see a little bit of variation in the soft costs there. So any, any questions on uh, future reporting on, on the budget? Do you think this, in general, meets your needs? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, mo moving on to the bid update, uh, this this graph just uh, tells you in blue where our estimates were, and then of course in orange where we've actually realized the bids. Uh, you can see that uh, this bid package two was our most significant bid package. Um, and uh, happy to report that package is about $1.8 million under budget, and that results in the 2.7% under budget on the overall project cost. Okay, this, this graph is uh, a, a consolidation of our master project budget and uh, just tells you where we are on the different categories, professional services, construction, owner direct expenses. Gives you a little bit of breakdown uh, within each category. Uh, tells you where wh what the budget was, what's been committed to date, uh, our projection on that versus what our original budget was, um, and then finally what we've got invoiced to date. There's a whole bunch of detail behind all this, and we're happy to share that detail with you at any time, but this gives you, as I said, a consolidated view of the overall budget. And then finally, we want to continue to give you a, a, a look ahead uh, on the project. Um, this, this tells you uh, where we are today, the star at the uh, award of subcontractors. Um, if we move on from that, um, we'll get that, s that small sliver of orange that you see here is that enabling work that I mentioned that happens on December 23rd and then uh, moving out to the end of March would be uh, the start of the additions at the middle schools. And then finally, uh, out on June 5th would be the start of construction for the elementary schools. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, I guess I wanted to open up the floor in terms of uh, questions on the uh, bid package two uh, that you might have. Questions or comments? I have two questions, um, and they might be answered in different formats. First, uh, there's a memo on this, but I think it's helpful for the community to hear it. There's a few places where Bullion Andrews is the awarded uh, vendor in a bid package that they fielded and so we'd love for you to speak to just how that process goes and how the how Bully and Andrews were selected as some of the vendors. Yeah, great. So you really have to think of Bully and Andrews with two different hats. So one, they're here as your construction manager. They're here to uh, administer and manage an overall process. But they're also one of, one of the bidders out there in the community, right? So we want to look to them like we look to other subcontractors in the community and to the degree that we can get their participation all, all the better right now when when you have a construction manager that winds up being also one of the subcontractors that is is doing the work that requires a little bit more focus from from your management team from the owner owner group to take a look at that now the categories that they've uh, were were the successful bidder on are categories where we did have multiple bids. One of them in particular is, is general trades. Uh, general trades is not, uh, not a very expensive component of the work here, and it can be a bit of a junk drawer. 
Uh, it's where we do uh, put work that is uh, facilitating work or enabling work. So you've got temporary stairs, um, fencing, um, safety railings that get erected, things like that. We, we did have an, another bidder on that. Frankly, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good benefit uh, to have your construction manager also be doing that kind of work. It's the kind of work that is really on demand and it facilitates work for the other subcontractors. So you wouldn't want to have to call in a, a, a different subcontractor and they say, hey, it doesn't work with my schedule. It's really difficult for Bullying and Andrews as a construction manager to say it doesn't work for their schedule, right? So that's one particular category where I think it's, it's a, a great benefit to have your construction manager doing that work. Uh, another was food service. Uh, I can't really speak uh, to uh, why food service is a really attractive bid, bid category for Bully and Andrews. I might ask uh, Peter to chime in on that, but there were, there were other bids on that as well. Uh, and then finally, we did have utilities, not, uh, not at Herrick, but O'Neill, uh, where Bully and Andrews was the successful bidder, and again, uh, against competition. And then, Kirath, just to piggyback off of that, in order for Bully and Andrews to be a bidder on any package that we put out, they do have to further contract, uh, seek permission um, from the district administration. And the way we go about granting that permission is to work closely with our owner's representatives to see if they see any red flags or issues with that. And then we go ahead and um, grant that position. So that's another filter uh, that we go through. So it is limited. And um, that's one of the reasons why we really we're in favor of an owner's representative format um, because it would just be another set of eyes on a bidder as Mike shared um, as we go through this process. Thanks. Second question of two. Uh, there's a couple of places where we're seeing a different vendor for Herrick versus O'Neill, mm -hmm. which generally makes sense because we put out different bid packages for those and folks came in uh, with different numbers. Uh, but I imagine, uh, maybe just looking down the road when we get past the referendum and now we're in maintenance mode and we have mechanical being put in by two different vendors, plumbing by two different vendors, uh, site utilities by two different vendors. If you foresee any challenges on the maintenance side for our, for our maintenance team with maintaining different sets of equipment or different sets of uh, replacement parts uh, because we have different vendors installing some of the pieces of the puzzle or if that's something that we uh, shouldn't worry about because everybody uses the same stuff just have different laborers Yeah, so p part of that part of the answer to that is uh, that we did break out equipment uh, in, Into that early bid package. So we tried to look at getting some bit consistency across really across the the whole district uh, with with some equipment do, trying to balance that with, uh, Making sure we can get get the best bids and not get uh, a sole, a, a, a single source on uh, on any type of uh, equipment that goes in. Uh, certainly, with respect to uh, mechanical systems, you're always concerned about the control system. Um, I might, I might ask uh, Kevin to, to speak a little bit to that. We've had quite a bit of discussion about that. Uh, anything you want to add there? Yeah. So the only uh, one fortunate aspect, although we do have two separate bidders, like Mike was just pointing out. Uh, that we're recommending for the efficiencies of cost. Uh, they are eventually going to use the same controls company, which is the platform we'll, we'll, we'll end up seeing. So the physical infrastructure and the installation is two separate companies, but the software side, we'll see one software side at the end. So that'd be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Member Doshi? Nope. Just one more. Um, point to add on to that, um, not only is it the same <coughs> control company, but also remember all of this, especially the mechanical, has to go through commissioning. And that is a single commissioner who is going to go through that prior to any of the buildings opening up to make sure that everything is running according to the specifications that were set by the owners, the architect, and the construction management uh, firm. So that's another check on that uh, process. But it's a really good question. Anyone else? Then I guess the only thing I, I want to mention is how um, this is a, I'm, this, this is obviously a very large bid process for us this time around, right? And with all the projects going on, I think one of the things I just I just want to remind and and be thankful that all of you guys are here is we're really looking 
to you know to the three of you and, and, and to White as well to to really give us a sign of, of faith in the in the contractors that we're we're working with, making sure that we've had an opportunity to look at their the back portfolio and the work that we do so that we can really trust the community really entrusted us to do a lot of work here for the district it's the first time really since the post-world war ii era that we've had a uh, an opportunity to do something across our entire district so i want to thank you guys for the hard work because obviously for us that went through these bid packages there was a lot there and um and there's a lot that we can't understand but there's a lot that that we really are looking um you know I was looking at Kevin earlier and stuff like that, just to, to, to see that level of confidence in the work that's going through. And so um, I just want to thank you for doing that and, and know that we're looking to you to kind of share with us that we have confidence in the team that we're building here to, to do that work. And then we're just looking forward to, to not only seeing that, that budgeting come back, but really let us know uh, as we move forward how on task we are um, with the actual work that's being done. So but thank you very much. Great. One final point is just, um, you know, Assistant Director Jeff Newstead and myself had the opportunity to sit through all the scope reviews with Bowling Andrews and the owner's reps. So, you know, at any point, uh, Mr. Steele uh, been here in the audience um, that was conducting them, you know, we were able to go through every line item and verify. So it was nice to not only have the, the owner's rep who we've hired with the substantial experience to go through this, but also, you know, for our direct district employees, Jeff and myself to go through and visualize this and see it and also rubber stamp, you know, give that approval that, you know, we believe in this too. Uh, at some point, it cost us a little bit of money on a couple of bid withdrawals. Um, obviously, the bottom line would have been better, but we know that we just can't accept those numbers. It's just gonna cause us problems down the road. So it was good that Bullying Andrews was able to identify that earlier on uh, in the process rather than, you know, midstream where we have to change and go from there. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, this moves us on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to engage in a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you please keep your comment to three minutes. Uh, at this time, I have received one card. I'm looking for Jennifer Shu from Kingsley. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Shu. I am the parent of an eight-year-old autistic boy named Ben. He's, he's one of those kids from the most needy population that Mr. Harris referred to earlier tonight. He should be in second grade here in Downers Grove, but he has been excluded from school since June of this year. You see, in March, I was coerced into agreeing to a placement change for him that would assign him to an appropriate therapeutic school, all because your special education administrators, Jessica Stewart and Lauren Hartelius, determined that my son needed an individual aid, but they could not hire one because, because of the hiring shortage here in Downers Grove with individual aids. I can confirm this because your administrators documented it in his IEP. Unfortunately, and unbeknownst to me, there is no such therapeutic school that exists within a reasonable distance from Downers Grove. Instead, my son has been sitting at home for the last six months, not allowed to attend school at the last school that served him, Kingsley Elementary. That's six months of no classroom instruction, no homebound tutoring, no speech therapy, no occupational therapy, no social work services, no social opportunities. Every day that Ben stays at home, he falls further and further behind, academically, socially, and functionally. To be clear, I am not expecting you to answer any question I might pose to you tonight due to the pending lawsuit that I have filed, which I assume you were all served with. But I would like the taxpayers of Downers Grove to be aware of the lengths this district and all of you are going to to keep a disabled child out of school. You have now retained four partners at an Itasca law firm to represent yourselves, and by my attorney's estimate, you have likely spent over $200,000 to, again, keep a child out of school. This district has an obligation and responsibility to educate every single child that resides within your boundaries, and yet you have given my son nothing. 
My disabled son is just like any other eight-year-old. He wants to go to school, make friends, be part of a school community. You and the administration of this district should be ashamed of yourselves. You are a disgrace to this community. Thank you. Thank you. That is the only card I have tonight. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak at this time? All right, that brings us to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the November 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes the November 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. All right, first up here is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? Okay, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements, consisting of the list of bills and summary and board member travel expenses? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. First up in our recommendations for action is the 2024 through 25 and the 25 to 26 school calendars. Is there a motion to approve the 24 through 25 and 25 through 26 school calendars as presented? So moved. Second. Nice. All right. Any discussion? I just want to say thank you for putting a two-year uh, calendar together. I know this is something that our community has asked for for quite some time, uh, and so I, I really do appreciate that. Also, just as a heads up, the calendar does look a little strange because we have one early start to the year and then one very late start to the year. Obviously, that ties in with construction. Once we get through some of our construction phases, that will normalize um, as well. Uh, so, all right. And just to add on to that, um, in that second year, the 25-26 calendar, you will see that we're starting after Labor Day. That's what Darren is referring to. Although through creative use of institute days and how we schedule parent-teacher conferences, and I'm speaking from memory, so I'm, I might be off a day or two, so I'm looking at Justin, I believe we still get out uh, June 5th or 6th. And so when you look at historically where we've been out as a school district, I still think that is uh, quite reasonable. And then as we get to the next two-year calendar, so next year we'll bring you know, the, the following year after that, that's when we'll have a discussion about does it make sense at that time to fully align with District 99? Do we want to have a little bit more of a buffer that final summer in 26? A lot of that will have to do with um, Peter's team with Bully and Andrews in terms of the construction schedule. But um, we are very proud of the two-year calendar. I want to thank our community for its patience as we work through that with COVID and all those other things. And uh, we're excited for this format. I know this is something that our community has really been um, asking for. We are starting as well this school year on a Friday, um, which is a little awkward to start the school year on a Friday. Um, but the, one of the reasons we chose that is it's the exact same start date as District 99, uh, which we really haven't been able to do since, well, I don't even remember a date when we were able to start the same as 99. So um, we are looking forward to that. And um, you know, starting on a Friday does have its benefits, especially for our little kids and really all kids. They come in and they get uh, you know, their feet wet, they introduce themselves, they meet their teacher, and then they start that full week and hit the ground running uh, the week after that. So I want to thank Justin for all his work with our Teachers Association, going through different drafts, hearing their feedback as well uh, to settle on this calendar, or calendars, I should say. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, Melissa, please. No, no. Uh, I can just do all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the 24 to 25 and 25 to 26 school calendars as presented. Next up, we have a resolution authorizing commencement of a social media litigation. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing commencement of the social media litigation as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, to adapt the resolution authorizing commencement of social media litigation as presented. Mm, I don't think so. Okay. 
Uh, next up is the con construction consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent construction consent agenda consisting of the bid group number two middle schools? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent uh, construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. A couple of announcements. Monday, December 18th at 3.45 p.m., the district leadership team will meet at O'Neill Middle School. On Tuesday, December the 19th at 7 a.m., the policy committee will meet at O'Neill Middle School. Wednesday, December the 20th at 3.45 p.m., the legislative committee will meet at O'Neill Middle School. And then on Monday, January 8th at 7 p.m. will be the next regular board meeting right here at Downers Grove Village Hall. Uh, the board will now meet in closed uh, session. In, uh, is there a motion to remove to closed session in order to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. Uh, consideration of student disciplinary matters, that's 5 ILCS 122C9. Uh, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, that's 5 ILCS 122C10. And litigation when the public finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting, that's 5 ILCS 122C11. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes, as mandated by Section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS, 122C21. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet at 830.